Welcome back to the Reading and Writing Podcast. My guest today is C.S. Porter, author of the new novel, Beneath Her Skin. Writer Anne Emery wrote about the novel, The writing is superb, the novel tightly plotted, the reader is swept along by the expert pacing and mounting suspense as the bodies pile up and suspects emerge from the shadows. C.S., welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Well, if someone listening hasn't yet heard about your novel Beneath Her Skin yet, how would you describe the novel? Um, basically, it's kind of a salty, dark East Coast murder thriller. Um, Detective Kess Morris is brought in from the city to help resolve this just ridiculous crime. Um, and she has to work with the local precinct in the in the small town. But I think, in essence, it's about uh, the moral ambiguity of of guilt and innocence. You know, they have that same hard edge. Um, hunter and prey become similar in some awkward way. Interesting. Do you remember the original idea or impetus that led you to write Beneath Her Skin? <laughs> I do. I was. I'm a photographer, and I was with my cameras out touring around the countryside here and I saw these hay bales and I just got to thinking about what if something was inside one of those hay bales because they're so huge <laughs> and that was the impetus and you went from there I think I did yes <laughs> I know it sounds a little odd but that that's actually what started it off no uh, I, I'm curious about what is your writing process when you were working on beneath their skin did you you just mentioned that you had this idea of what was inside the hay bale. Did you uh, think about that and end up outlining and thinking about where the novel was going to go? Or did you just have that initial idea or image of um, something or a body inside one of those hay bales and then just kind of dive into the narrative? How does that work for you? Um. So, yes, the the plot point began with that. So that that's where I began. And then and then you have to figure out a whole structure that goes with that. And as I was working on that, the detective Kess Morris just literally came to me. Um I, I wasn't I wasn't cognizant of her at all. And then as as a good book should, I think, then the um or as a book should, then the character became the most important part. And so then the two of them went together. Um, by that, I mean the character and the plot. Um, and so I just traipsed around with her trying to resolve this crime and other crimes popped up and other characters popped up and it, and it grew from there. And can you tell us about your character, Kess Morris? Um, I think she's almost feral in, in a sense. <laughs> When I when I go out for a day photographing, I get very um, I get very involved. Or when I'm working on a movie, um, and I don't really notice myself at all. It's about it's about the job at hand, as it were. And I think she's very much like that. Um, she's persistent, um, and I, I like her strength, and I, I like I like that idea of her of her resilience towards her work at the detriment of her own personal life. And, and so I'm curious if, if we could back up for a moment, what was your initial writing journey that led you to writing your first stories and eventually your first novel? Um, yeah. So to be honest, um, my life was in making films and, and I got MS. So I got really, uh, tired and and I my my physicality didn't work anymore so I couldn't do that any longer um I can still make photographs you know I you can you can drive to sites and whatnot but it, it just got really difficult so it's something I'd always wanted to do to write a story and I it was COVID and it was everything and I just thought I'm I'm gonna really try I mean I've been reading my whole life and of course films are based on scripts so I had a notion, but I had no idea of how, how difficult it is, <laughs> to be <laughs> honest. But I stuck with it every morning. I would 
set out and get going, you know? And, and I'm curious, what, what was that, what was that difficulty for you? What did you discover? Um, because I think that that's not an uncommon experience for people when they sit down and decide to write a novel that they suddenly discover that, wow, like, even though I've read hundreds, if not thousands of novels, actually crafting one is, is different. So what was that process like for you? Yeah. Um, super frustrating at the beginning. Like when I read someone like uh, Jim Harrison, I get the feeling that he just kind of sat down and <laughs> wrote this book, right? Because <laughs> it sort of feels like you're sitting with a man talking. And I remember my first day getting going on it and I was just so excited. And I got a, a good chunk of writing in and I felt really good, made dinner and then got up the next morning, ready to go again and read what I'd written and realized that most of it was just ridiculous. <laughs> and it was super frustrating, but not to the point that I was going to stop. So I just had to rip most of it out, keep the little nucleus that started it and continue. Um, yeah, it's, it's. It's much more of a process. I have much higher regard for it now that I've tried. Yes. And and so what what did you discover for yourself um, in terms of uh, in in terms of writing and, and the process to to get it to a point that you felt um, you know that that uh, that you were comfortable with or that you know, uh, kind of resonated with you in terms of novels that you had read. I understand. What was it? A lot of rewriting, revising. What, what did that look like for you? When it comes to image making, when I'm putting up a show for a, for a gallery, I'm, I'm pretty quick at assessing my own work and getting rid of stuff that doesn't work and putting things together that do. I can do that with image making. So I thought I've got to learn how to do that with writing. And, and admitting that that just doesn't work. So what I really, really, really learned the most, I think, was that the first draft is literally that and that you work from and around there and be, um, be comfortable at ripping chunks of it apart and admitting to yourself that it just doesn't work, whether it's structure or, uh, um, plot points, character. I mean, that just doesn't suit her character. Um, dialogue, make it short and snappy, not, not belabored. So I was learning all that as I was going. Um, I hope that answers your question in some way. Hey, this is Jeff from the Reading and Writing Podcast. Do you know what I love when I'm reading a great new book? A cup of tea. It's such a fun ritual. Settling down with a cup of tea and a new novel that I'm excited to read. Why not treat yourself to a cup of plum deluxe teas? Every loose leaf tea is hand blended, fresh, using only the best ingredients. From bold black teas to relaxing herbal blends, incredible dessert teas, or fun floral flavors, there's a delicious tea waiting for you. And I'm not making this up. They have a flavor of tea called Reading Nook Blend Black Tea. It's a tea that pairs perfectly with reading, writing, and relaxing. Plum Deluxe is a family-owned business, and they have one of the best selections of delicious, flavorful herbal teas, as well as bold black tea flavors. Visit plumdeluxe.com slash listen and use the promo code RWP to save 12% on your first order. T also makes a great gift. That's plumdeluxe.com slash listen and use the promo code RWP. There's nothing better than enjoying a great cup of tea with a good book. And now you can get your great tea from PlumDeluxe.com. Hey, this is Jeff, host of the podcast. You know, sometimes it seems like there's just an infinite amount of information out there. 
And that's exactly why I love Wondrium. Wondrium is a streaming platform that offers thousands of programs and documentaries from respected experts who really know their stuff. And for the listeners of this podcast, Wondrium has a wide selection of writing resources, how to write best-selling fiction, how to publish your book, writing creative nonfiction, every day is a poem, how to create comics, and much, much more. And the best part, you can watch or listen anytime, anywhere with the Wondrium app. Download and watch or listen on the go. Explore all of your wonders with Wondrium, and your brain will love it. That's W-O-N-D-R-I-U-M dot com slash B-O-O-K-S. Again, sign up today at Wondrium.com slash books to get unlimited access with a 14-day free trial. Give it a try. Yeah, it, it does. Um, I'm I'm curious, have you started working on another novel yet about your detective, Kes Morris? I believe I have. <laughs> yes, I think um, I think I've just finished the second draft. That's great. Well, well, given your experience uh, of writing this novel, what writing advice would you offer for someone who's listening who is working on their own story or novel? <laughs> that that would be hard for me to give anyone advice. Um, I think uh, I think truth, being truthful to yourself, being truthful to your characters, um, being persistent. I think you have to. I think you have to stay at it. Like when I, what I learned when I was working was that it stays with you even when you're not working. Um, The characters rattling around in your head, the plots rattling around in your head, you realize something's not working. And so you have to give yourself space and definitely time to make, to make the work proceed every day. I think to keep at it. In other words, were there writers or or novels that inspired you as you were working on on your novel? No, um, no. Uh, beforehand, always there are there are people that inspire me, of course. But I find mm, that I'd rather stay steeped in my own little world as I'm working on it, rather than entering someone else's world, because I think you can, by osmosis, get influenced, like. If you were reading um, Thomas McCann or something, in the, and, and the wordsmithing is just so brilliant mm-hmm. that you could go, oh, I've got to do a bit of that or, or something. And there, there's, you don't want to emulate anything. So I, no, I didn't, I did not read when I was writing. Well, I'm curious, uh, are you reading now and, and, are there novels or nonfiction books that you've read recently that you enjoyed? Yeah, for sure. Um, uh, a Paragon, I just thought was amazing um, as a novel. And I read just recently um, Empire of Illusion, um, Chris Hedges, which I thought was really interesting. Like really interesting. That That's my latest uh, two books. That's great. Well, Where can people find you online if they'd like to learn more about you and your novel Beneath Her Skin? Well, C.S. Porter has a a very small Facebook page that was just sort of thrown together for this book specifically. And then there's um, Christopher Christopher Porter Photography um, for image making and so on. That's great. Well, again, we've been speaking with C.S. Porter, author of the new novel, Beneath Her Skin. The novel is available now, so go buy a copy. And C.S., thanks for doing this interview. Hey, thank you very much. Absolutely. Kess was thankful it was Sunday morning. The road was wide open, and she shifted up a gear. She reached into her coat pocket, found the vial of pills, popped the lid, and shook one into her palm. Down the hatch, she thought, as she swallowed. 
She no longer needed them for pain. Her dislocated shoulder had healed. She just liked how they made her feel. They quieted her mind from the chatter of other cases. One pill seemed to filter the constant barrage of details that others didn't seem to notice, like the 22 highway signs she'd passed, two flattened porcupines, and seven coffee cups in the dish. So she could focus on what was actually important. Her father said it was a gift to remember everything she wasn't so sure. There were so many things she liked to forget. She checked her watch. The pill would kick in about when she arrived. She rolled down her window and breathed in the salt air. She noticed the speedometer higher. The bird's eye maple dash and interior chrome gleamed. Kessa's father had been a bit like this car, tough, solid, and could take the sharpest corners but still stay on the road. And both had an unusual attractive look about them. Classic is how she would describe them. The jag had been his best self, his indulgence, his escape, his happiness. Directly across from Kess was a log cabin set back against a copse of sugar maples, with thin hoses running between the trunks. This was the right place. The cabin was meager. It didn't appear well made and certainly wasn't well kept. There was a burn pile near the middle of the clearing, a stack of rusted metal next to a woodshed, and an outhouse that was certainly remote and dead quiet. There was a single jury-rigged power line snaking through the woods to the road. The wood stove chimney wasn't smoking. She headed across the yard and hoped that the front door would be unlocked. The ground was uneven and pitted with short stumps and dead branches. She moved carefully over the wet, moss-covered rocks. She didn't want to bust an ankle back here. In the middle of the clearing, she paused at the burn pile and kicked at the cold ash and churned wood. Nothing unusual. Kess looked to the house and noticed a single wooden chair propped next to the front door. Rex was accustomed to being alone. She noticed the chopping block and axe nearby and looked back to the road. He would have seen anyone coming in. Probably would have heard the vehicle for miles. She looked to the dense wood bringing the clearing. It seemed impassable. She swiped away a black fly and took a step forward. A branch snapped loudly underfoot. A young deer crashed from the woods behind her and bolted towards the cabin. She watched, amazed at its speed, sure-footedness, and graceful bounds. There were still white foot flecks on its back. She marveled at the power of, the, of its hindquarters. It was dazzling. She felt fortunate to see it. It leapt and for a fraction of a second it seemed to freeze midair. She saw the glint of a wire, and the deer's front legs wrenched back, neck outstretched. It crashed, chest first into the ground, and her world exploded. Sure, we have 30 seconds to tell you that drivers who switched to Progressive could save big. But then what? Well, we could try to fill the remaining time with awkward pauses. It's often done for comedic effect. Is it working? I can't tell if this is funny. Maybe this is so bad it's funny. Wow, we really peaked at the save big when you switched to progressive part. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates.